All right, thanks. So, um, yeah, I think the first part of this talk is going to be a little bit repetitive compared to what you've seen. Uh, so, as several people already mentioned, generative adversarial nets and variational autoencoders. So, I'll just can go over this a little bit more quickly, but I will go a little bit more into the theory and, and the derivation, because I think that's, especially for gener um, variation autoencoders, it's useful to see some connections with physics. Um, and yeah, OK, let's start. And then in the last part, I will talk about flows. And uh, that's a special way of uh, doing generative networks using a, um, in, in for, for, the, for the nets that I will talk about, they will be invertible neural nets, but more about that later. So basically, the idea of generative uh, modeling is, first of all, it's an unsupervised learning technique. Um, we want to learn something about the probability distribution of data. Um, or not necessarily data, but basically we want to learn a probability distribution and ideally be able to sample from that probability distribution efficiently. And so there's a whole class of generative learning methods. This is not a new field, but it has basically, like many f areas of uh, machine learning, um, uh, seen a renaissance in the last couple of years. And um, recently, there has been a lot of attention on uh, so-called directed generative networks. So something that has been around for a while, but hasn't been very efficient or expressive until about five years ago. And the idea about um, of, of directed generative networks is uh, there is um, a feed-forward model, like a feed-forward neural network. And you basically insert noise, so um, random variables from a distribution that you define and that uh, is somehow easy to sample from, like multivariate Gaussian uh, variables. And you learn to transform this noise into objects, samples of objects that you're interested in, like samples of faces. And that sounds a little bit like magic. And of course, we have to uh, somehow train the network to do this, either using data or using some other principle that tells us something about the distribution of interest. Um, now, um, OK, so the idea basically is to say we have a prior distribution. Um, that is tractable, so it's easy for us to, we can write it down, we can sample from it. And also for every, uh, for every sample we can uh, evaluate the probability density, or at least up to a, up to a normalization con constant, we can evaluate the probability density P of Z. Um, and we want to use that in order to sample the intractable P of X. And we are going to We'll, we'll do that by writing down a transformation G, so that's, that will be our neural network, that uses C as an input and some trainable parameters. And uh, we, we want to approximate P of X somehow by training the network. Um, so um, basically, we hope that we can express a complex distribution by using a complicated function G. Um, okay, so well-known architectures are variational autoencoders and, and GANs, no GANs. Um, basic idea is r transformation of random variables. So we have a simple distribution of random variables. We apply transformation to it and get some more interesting distribution. So for example, here you see Gaussian random variables fed through this function and then you get something that's on a ring. And the question is, of course, if we have a complex uh, distribution of complex objects, like images of faces or so, how do we, how do we train that? Uh, what is even the distribution that we're interested in? OK, so, so that's the question we have the an to answer. And there are essentially, so you can categorize these approaches into three classes. So uh, those where we don't have a likelihood model or the likelihood of the model is untractable. So that means we can somehow generate samples p of x by go feeding noise through a function, but we cannot evaluate p of x 
right? We can generate samples, but we, for any given sample, we don't know what the probability of the model to generate that sample is, um, uh, because we have somehow used um, a function where we don't know how many um, points z map to the same x. And um, a model in this class is the generative adversarial net. So uh, we have to come up with some training method which does not use, for example, the likelihood p of x, because that's not accessible for us. Then there are approximate likelihood methods where we cannot really compute p of x, but some approximation to it. Um, and that's, for example, the variational autoencoder is in this class. And then we have models where we can compute p of x. Um, and in order to do that, we have to restrict our functions g um, to do this transformation. Uh, so we give something up. We, we have to restrict the functions we can use here. So maybe it's less powerful. Maybe the transformation is less powerful. But then we can evaluate p of x. Um, and in this class, we have the flow-based models. And I'll talk about that in the end. All right, generative adversarial networks first. Dima? So in these kinds of things where you have this P of X, right? Uh -huh. I would imagine that in many physical instances where you have conservation laws and so forth, this P of X is in fact a density on a lower dimensional thing, right? It could be, uh, could be lower dimensional, but in, in physics, in physics situations, it could also be that you actually know p of x up to a scaling factor. Okay, but I'm, I'm, my my issue is whether uh, when you write it like this, you make any assumptions on the rank of this g that, that this g would you know not be a, a maximal rank function <coughs> because you want its image to be in a kind of a lower dimensional set, and then then it all becomes a little delicate, right? Because you have all these directions in which it squishes things and so on. So is that an issue, or is that something that, that never comes up? Mm. So I mean, in the in the applications that I will discuss, uh, the idea is to really sample from the full uh, dimensional space, so your, the output of this network G will have the full dimension, but you could, for example, feed in only um, a, a lower number of, uh, so, so Z could be lesser dimensional than X, and in that sense you're actually sampling on a manifold. And that is actually often done. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so generative adversarial nets. So we cannot train it uh, again using p of x because we don't have p of x. And the idea here is basically to set up a game uh, between two adversaries, two networks, so the generator and the discriminator network. The generator network um, uh, takes noise or some easy to sample z, transforms it into x, and uh, that we want, this is the object that we're interested in. So we want to train the generator to be able to give us good samples of x that look like particular images, for example. Um, and then we use this discriminator network, um, and we will train the generator and the discriminator concurrently. Uh, the discriminator has the task of telling whether a sample that it gets, so the discriminator works on X, whether a sample that it gets comes from the generator, so it's a fake sample, or whether it's a real sample. So the idea of GANS is to, we have a lot of data, uh, so we have a database of examples X. We do not explicitly know what distribution they come from. It's just examples. Um, and uh, we train these two networks uh, that essentially f battle each other um, to become better than the other one. Um, uh, to uh, in, uh, su Such that in the end, hopefully, we can generate samples that are realistically looking uh, such that the discriminator in the end will uh, not be able to tell the difference. Okay, so um, we define the, a zero-sum game, so we define a reward function, and uh, we give the discriminator um, a certain reward, a reward v, which depends on the parameters of the generator and the discriminator, and the generator just gets minus the same reward. So whenever the generator wins, the discriminator loses, and vice versa. 
Okay. okay. So as a um, diagram, it looks like this. We have random noise, go through the generator, generate a fake image uh, or a fake data point. Um, and at the same point, we have a training data set with um, 50% probability will either show a fake or a real image to the discriminator. The discriminator is just a, a classifier uh, that says, is this real or fake? And um, we will uh, basically try to optimize these two simultaneously with this min-max function. <coughs> so so both, uh, both players are trying to maximize their reward, and because the discriminator's reward is minus the generator's reward, this is a min-max problem. So um, there are different choices for this function v. The default choice, so the standard generative adversarial network choice is this one, uh, where we basically say, um, uh, so d is just, uh, so the discriminator just basically gives us a value between 0 or 1, where 1 corresponds to uh, discriminator thinks this is a real sample. So um, what we could do is we could, whenever we sample, uh, sample from the real, uh, the real ones, so this is from the database, um, then uh, the discriminator gets a reward if it says, yes, this is a real sample. Whereas um, if it actually comes from the um, generated samples, uh, then it gets a penalty. So it's one minus the, uh, uh, the prediction of the discriminator, right? So um, and because the uh, generator just uh, is rewarded by minus v, it is rewarded whenever it fools the discriminator. Okay, at the convergence of this um, learning problem, the generator sample should be indistinguishable from real data. Uh, so that means the discriminator can only output 0 0.5 everywhere uh, because uh, all the same uh, samples look equally good to the discriminator. Nice thing is we don't need any uh, variational approximation or so. You will see what I mean in the next part of the talk. Um, and if we can solve the discriminator um, optimization problem reliably, so in particular when this part of the optimization problem is convex in the discriminator's parameters, then we can actually show convergence for this problem. Um, in practice, this is not so easy um, uh, because if we just use a um, neural network for the discriminator, this is not a convex function. We cannot guarantee convergence at any, at any point. Um, and um, in general, we are, because we have the min-max problem, we're looking for a saddle point, not a global minimum or maximum in the parameters. And uh, yeah, optimization to saddle points is hard. Uh, so we can have situations where the two networks just oscillate and uh, they're never really at a good solution. So we have a crappy discriminator and a crappy uh, generator uh, beating each other, but uh, there's not a good solution. Uh, so this can happen. And um, optimization of GANs can be quite expensive too, because we essentially iteratively train two neural networks. All right, so, uh, but um, GANs are um, great, great to, uh, to get impressively looking results. Let's, let me put it like this. So, uh, uh, for example, what you can do, uh, uh, the, so the idea is that in this latent space, so the latent space is the space where I'm starting uh, to generate random variables from, um, the idea is that in this space, we somehow have a simple structure where we can do things like interpolation or other simple arithmetic operations, for example, that will be meaningful operations in our image space. 
or in our observable space. So we can do things like, uh, this is actually quite old result, so it looks a little bit crappy, but you get the idea. Uh, so we could mm. take samples of a man with glasses, subtract samples of men without glasses. So this is all operations in the latent space. Add uh, samples of women with glasses, and then we get uh, without glasses, and then we get women with glasses. Right? So we kind of subtract and add the glasses, um, and we get a transformation which looks meaningful in our image space. And of course, if we would directly do this in the pixel space, we would just get random noise. Right? You would not get any meaningful result if you did this in image space. So um, these are some old results, samples of uh, birds, ants, monasteries. Some of these look meaningful, others not so much. Uh, what works pretty well here are vo volcanoes. Maybe they are not so complicated. Um, and you can play a lot of tricks with GANs if you combine them, for example, with other networks or you condition them on some inputs. So this is GANs essentially um, uh, used with uh, for for in painting, so we take out um, part of the image, we fill in random noise, and we learn to generate um, um, <coughs> to in paint, so to essentially re replace this missing part. Um, and this is using two GANs. One uh, uses a local, and a, another one a, a global discriminator. Sorry, it's one GAN, but it uses two discriminators. Um, and it's trained on images where we just take random parts and we delete them and we try to reconstruct something that looks realistic. And then, um, yeah, we can do things like uh, yeah, remove part of the image, reconstruct it with something that looks realistic, remove glasses, and then maybe the network fills in eyes because, of course, it doesn't know that there were glasses here. Um, you can do things like um, um, use conditions uh, to the generator and the discriminator. Um, so for example, what we could do is we could take um, objects such as shoes or maps and condition it on uh, just a contour of that object that we're interested in generating. Yeah, so the idea is we can draw up a sketch of like a piece of clothing and have a network paint it for us. Uh, very useful for designers. Or we could take uh, uh, Google Maps, uh, train it to uh, generate um, the satellite image of the, of the same map. And uh, so yeah, this, is, this is actually work from uh, Bernard Chirikov's group. And here you see that uh, you can get quite interesting um, uh, samples that actually look like design objects. OK, so it has been um, quite difficult to sample um, high resolution images uh, with this technique for some time. Then a breakthrough. Uh, to go towards high resolution images was this progressive growing of GANs, and that's an NVIDIA paper from 2018. And here, basically, they used a multi scale training method. So, what they did here is to use, uh, to, so eventually to train on images from this CELAB A data sets, basically, lots of high resolution image, uh, 1024 by 1024 pixels of celebrities. And um, what they did was to subsample these images to coarser resolutions and then first train on coarse images, like on 4x4 four four images. So train GAN on that. And then um, keep some of the parameters here fixed, add um, uh, another convolutional layer to the GAN that goes from 4x4 four to 8x8, four four eight eight. train that on the subsampled images that are 8 by 8 in resolution. And uh, just modify the parameters of this added, added layer, of this recently added layer, and so on, until you are uh, at 
1024 by 1024, and in the end, uh, they train all of the parameters. So essentially, it's a, it's kind of a trick to um, um, find parameters for this high-dimensional GAN in a progressive way. Um, and with that, you can actually sample really cool-looking images of, of celebrities that you think they're probably real. Like, this isn't this a wrestler, or uh, like, this is a, I think this is an Italian football player. But actually, they're not, so they're to just totally made up. Um, <clears throat> and you can actually see that these pictures are made up if you go away from human images and you try to sample something like planes. Um, so there can be some disasters here. So clearly, uh, the network hasn't learned much about what a plane is, but uh, uses some fancy image processing uh, techniques, essentially, to piece images together. And yeah, well, phase database are probably easier than, than planes. OK. Um, so another cool application of GANs is this one, cycle GANs. Uh, so here we use two GANs. And we have essentially two uh, sets of data uh, that correspond, for example, to different styles of images. Like you could have photographs and paintings. Um, or you could have, uh, like this, this example is horses and zebras, okay? Um, and the idea is you train two GANs uh, whose generators learn to map from one point, uh, from a point in, in space one to a point in, in space two. And uh, there should be kind of a reverse generator that's able to map back. And the idea is that we can take samples from one space and kind of transform it to the other in order to change like a style or uh, like the change certain aspects of the image. Okay. So we start from a, a sample of an image uh, that goes into discriminator A, because that could be a real or a fake sample from the last round. Uh, we have a generator conditioned on this input. Um, and the generator is supposed to transform this image to uh, distribution 2 or distribution B. Uh, then we have a discriminator here that needs to dis um, decide whether this is real or fake. And then we have a generator conditioned on this guy. Um, he's trying to go back to distribution A. And then we have an additional loss term that tries to make these two samples similar to each other. So we try to establish kind of a point-to-point -point mapping between these two distributions with these two generators. And so what we can do with it, we can, uh, for example, input paintings of Monet and transform it into photos, or vice versa. Or we can take a photo and transform it to a Monet image, a Van Gogh image, a Cezanne image, etc., etc. So you can play really cool tricks with this. And um, one thing that has been quite controversial is an application um, that was done by a um, group at um, Carnegie Mellon of this uh, cycle again on videos. And so this is basically faking videos. So this is on the left, you see an actual video of um, John Oliver. And on the right, you see a generated video that has been uh, trained on, on uh, videos of Stephen Colbert. Uh, so this guy basically takes the video of um, uh, John Oliver and transforms it into a Stephen Colbert video who looks basically the same. And there's no audio, unfortunately, but he says the same things. Right, but just as another person, and yeah, I think with John Oliver and Stephen Colbert, it's still funny. But any, of course, you can do. Okay, that's that's also funny. <laughs> <coughs> and you can do things like this, like the blooming of flowers. <coughs> And you can do things like this, like Martin Luther King's speech given by Obama. 
that could actually happen. Uh, that probably has happened. <coughs> But you could do things like this, uh, which are getting a little bit scary. <laughs> Although this direction would still be OK. The reverse direction would be a problem, I guess. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's see. All right, so this was the gun part. Any questions so far? Good. So let's go to, yes. Yeah. It's similar. You also have a reconstruction loss, but but it's a different method and a different training principle, of course, mm -hmm. because you still train it as a um, with this adversarial loss, Jonas. I think there's also an that uses the function. So yes. Yes. Yeah. So there are many combinations of these methods with one another. So, um, uh, for example, you can use flows as part of guns, and you have a flow gun, etc. So. So the videos had some artifacts, right? Yes. Are there ways where you can somehow incorporate constraints or invariances that prevent that? So. Mm. Const I like the plane. There's no yeah. hole in it, right? Yeah. So somehow put that in. Yeah, that's not so easy in this representation, of course, because we work in, in pixel space here. So everything is, is, is implicit. Um, so, so it's difficult to like, express a constraint. Like if you generate a plane, it should like, be a, contin um, like a contiguous object and it shouldn't fall apart, right? You have to have some sort of mechanistic model in order to do that. So you have to have sort of a latent representation where you can do that. So in, I think in the, in the normal GAN setting, that would be difficult to do. Yes? Were those videos with like the face swapping, was that one frame at a time, or did they have sequences of images so that there could be a... I'm not sure. I think probably sequences, but I would have to look at the paper myself. Okay, let's talk about variational autoencoders. So here's a reminder about the normal, non-variational autoencoders. So the idea is we have... Um, images, for example, or other high dimensional objects. We go through a bottleneck, uh, the latent space or the code. And uh, although uh, an autoencoder will not explicitly learn something that we can humanly interpret, we can think about uh, these as being attributes of the image that somehow express in a com compact form what type of image we have. Okay. So um, anyway, a normal autoencoder is a deterministic feedforward neural network. So any given image uh, will always, after training, map to a fixed latent code. Now, um, the hand wavy way of explaining an autoencoder, a variational autoencoder, is let's um, instead of doing a deterministic encoding, let's do a stochastic encoding, where instead of mapping an image to one point in latent space, we map to a probability distribution of latent uh, codes. So for example, the smile of this boy would be some, somewhere here with a certain uncertainty. And this, in the Mona Lisa, it would be pretty neutral. And depending who you asked, it could be like she's happy or not so happy. Right? So she, um, you have a large uncertainty here, etc. So, um, so we have a probabilistic encoding of latent space val values for a given input. And um, uh, we have the following objects in a variation autoencoder. So we have an encoder uh, that does this probabilistic mapping. So it, defi it defines a probability distribution of latent variables for a given x. Um, then uh, we sample from this probability distribution and then decode the sample uh, to an X again. And um, so some features of the variational autoencoder, it, is, it enforces uh, that the latent space representation is uh, more continuous and smooth compared to the uh, normal autoencoder, which does not say anything about what happens with points that we didn't have in the 
in the training data. Mm -hmm. And Patrick showed, a, showed an image representing this. Uh, so what we want is that values that are nearby to one another in latent space are in some sense similar. So we want a certain sense of smoothness and continuity in the mapping of latent variables to um, images. All right. So, um, and less hand-wavingly, um, we can um, explain an autoencoder, a variational autoencoder, actually with a quite classical physics method. So, and a tool that we need for this is the uh, KL divergence, kullback leibler divergence. That's a way to measure the distance between two probability distributions. So it's, uh, one uh, sort of functional that we can use to make one probability distribution similar to another probability distribution. And it's defined, uh, the KL divergence of Q and P is defined as this integral. So this is uh, the integral over X, uh, probability distribution Q, uh, log Q divided by P. All right. So we could, um, uh, we can see this as an expectation value with respect to the Q distribution of this logarithmic difference here. Now this can be written as log Q minus log P. Okay, so properties, first of all, this is um, um, sort of a distance, it's a non-negative function. Uh, for Q equals P, the real divergence will be zero and otherwise it's positive but it's not a proper metric because it's not symmetric. Right? If you exchange P and Q, you get a different function, a different functional. There are also symmetric versions of this idea, the Chance and Shannon divergence, for example, but this one is not symmetric. Okay, so um, variational approximation of probability distributions is something that's quite established in physics and statistical physics. So consider, for example, the situation that we have a, a physical system um, that is characterized by configurations X. We have an energy function U and we have a probability density defined by U of X. So this is a, is a very common thing in statistical physics or in molecular, molecular physics especially. We're working with energy functions all the time. And often these energy functions are complicated. They have mm. two, three, four body terms. Um, and uh, in principle, we have defined a probability distribution, but it may be very difficult to sample from it. Uh, so we use things like molecular dynamics or Markov chain Monte Carlo because we have no direct way of sampling of P of X, even though for a given sample we could evaluate the probability density or we could at least relative to other points. All right, um, and uh, um, one of the big problems here is to, to evaluate integrals, right? This is, this is so, for example, if you wanted to evaluate the partition function or the logarithm of the partition function, which is a free energy, that's difficult to do because we cannot execute this integral directly. All right, so one uh, thing we could do is we can write down the free energy, the absolute free energy of this distribution, which is minus the logarithm of this um, partition function here. And um, by inserting uh, these equations, we can essentially um, uh, re ex we can express this as the mean energy um, given the distribution P. So if we sample uh, X from P, the mean energy minus the entropy of the distribution. Right, so far we haven't really gained anything because we still can't evaluate this quantity, especially H is difficult to sample. Um, but so what the idea now is to replace P by another distribution that is tractable. Tractable means it should be easy to sample from. So for example, Q could be something where uh, the individual dimensions of X are independent. That would be a very simple choice because then we can just sample them independently from some Gaussian distribution or something else. Um, and, and well, then of course we'll make a big, big error, but we can try to minimize this error by saying we uh, make this additionally dependent on some parameters and we can tune these parameters to make the distribution similar. So then we can write down the free energy of this new distribution, the fake distribution basically, or the approximate distribution. Um, and uh, if we write down the difference between these two free energies, 
and insert, we insert all of this stuff, we can show that we actually minimize the KL divergence between the two distributions. Um, and this is the, the KL divergence where we sample from the Q distribution. So this is the distribution that by design we have made easy to sample from. And because the KL divergence is also always non-negative, um, we can also see here that the free energy of the approximate distribution is um, always an upper bound to the uh, uh, true free energy. So instead of minimizing the KL divergence, we can also minimize the variational free energy. So that's the variational approximation idea. So, so, so the asymmetry comes from the fact that you're still using the potential end for the Q distribution. Sorry, say that again? Symmetry in the, in the KL divergence comes from the fact that you're using U as the potential in computing that Q term. Well, the, the asymmetry comes from the fact that if you, if you uh, well, exchange P and Q, it's not the same function here, independent of. But I mean, in your free energies, Mm -hmm. If Q is not the free energy of Q, it's. it's oh, yeah, 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 yeah right, yeah. That's the. That's the so u is the same function. And so u is related to p of x. Right? And this is how, how this free energy also depends on p of x. Yeah. OK, so we can do this, for example, for the Ising model. Right? So Ising model, um, something like this. So this is a very simple model. Uh, we have spins up or down on a grid, and they interact with their neighbors. Uh, we write down a um, um, potential energy function um, that basically tells us how happy every spin is. So uh, typically, uh, spins are happy when they are aligned with other spins. So then it's low um, energy, and otherwise it's a high energy. And we sample this system, for example, with Monte Carlo moves, where we just flip spins and accept or reject, uh, depending on the change in the energy. And uh, depending on the settings of the parameters of these models, you can uh, simulate quite a lot of interesting physical phenomena with that. So this has been designed to study magnetization um, in solid states, but uh, you can use Ising models for all kinds of things. And um, so this is an example where uh, it can be quite challenging to sample the distribution of these models. Um, so for example, uh, um, when you start with this uh, random spin distribution in the beginning and you simulate the system at a low temperature, you will get this formation of structure. So the system will want to go to a situation where all the spins are aligned, but you get this critical slowing down phenomena, uh, which is because you have these islands of a lot of spins up, a lot of spins down, and then in order to uh, go towards the global minimum, which is all spins up or all spins down, um, you would have to make a massive change uh, to the system. You, have to, you would have to flip a lot of spins at once, and that's hard to do. So you're, you're getting trapped in these metastable phases. Okay, so it would be nice uh, if we could instead uh, design a, um, a distribution that's easy to sample from. So the, the um, simplest approach is to say, all right, this is our original. Um, energy function, which is difficult to sample from, because it has these spin-spin uh, couplings here. Uh, so we can only do Monte Carlo or things, things like that. Monte Carlo moves somehow. Um, but so what we could do is we could say instead of um, p of x, which is defined as p of uh, uh, s e to the minus u of x, um, we, we sample from q of x. Uh, so this is our variational distribution, which we just define uh, to be as a distribution uh, in which all the spins are uncoupled. So it's e to the sum of um, uh, the individual spin setting times some parameter. Very simple. So the, the probability distribution just decomposes into these independent terms, and this is just a normalization constant here. Um, so this is a mean field approximation. Yeah? This is basically the Hartree model of uh, magnetization, if you like. Um, 
uh, if you do this, uh, then you can write down the entropy of your system as a very simple pair, uh, one body term summation. So you sum over all spins and you have q log q and one minus q log one minus q with this q, that's just the probability of the spin to be up. Um, and you can also write down the mean energy in terms of these mean spin values, which are just the hyperbolic tangents of the uh, of these parameters that we need to optimize. And then basically we insert these two things, um, so the entropy and the mean energy, into the variational free energy. We minimize it, so we just take the derivative of the free energy with respect to the parameters theta, um, set it to zero, and then we get um, these two equations and we can uh, iterate them uh, to find a fixed point. So that's a standard physical a physics textbook method to do variational approximation. We have a, a difficult to sample from probability distribution. We replace it by something that's easy to sample from, some mean field model or something that's, that's, that's maybe less simple but still feasible to sample from. Uh, we introduce some parameters to kind of fudge one uh, distribution to be similar to one to the other and we optimize that. So, um, yeah, now variational autoencoders are basically just taking this idea and and putting some throwing some deep neural networks in. That's that's essentially what it is. So um, back to the variational autoencoder idea. So so what we wanted to do is to obtain a generator that goes from latent space variables to samples that are somehow realistically looking or that ha have a similar distribution as our data distribution that we trained it with. Um, so we really we're interested in P of X given C, um, but because initially we don't um, uh, know uh, how, to, how to train this uh, transformation from Z to X, uh, we will also need to use an encoder that goes from X to Z. I mean, this encoder essentially just helps us to train this whole thing. In the end, we'll throw it away. And so this is um, a little bit different than the previous example because now we have a second set of variables here that are the latent variables. So this is a latent variables um, um, model. We are interested in P of X given Z, but we have to compute PZ given X in order to get there. We can do this with base um, equation, but unfortunately uh, then we run into this P of X. P of X is this integral over this product and that's intractable again. So we cannot generally evaluate this integral if there is some neural network representing P of X given Z. So we have to avoid doing that somehow. <coughs> um, or do something like Markov chain Monte Carlo to approximate the integral, but that's, that's another story. So the idea is now to use variational inference uh, to approximate P of Z given X with another distribution that helps us to avoid computing this integral. Okay, so we do this by saying there's another distribution Q of C given X that is tractable. We minimize the KL divergence between these two distributions. That's formally this object here, which again is something that we cannot directly compute because we run into this P of X. Um, so we work on this a little bit, just using base equation and some basic algebra again. We can rewrite this KL divergence into this expression, which is nicer because we can work with this. And then we have plus log P. So log P is just the log likelihood of our model, right? So if we could compute log P, uh, X that would be nice because then we could do a likelihood maximization. We could essentially change the variables of our model to produce the images we have in our database with high probability, with a high likelihood. Um, but so because the KL divergence is greater or equal zero, this um, L expression is bound to our likelihood. So now we use just the fact that KL, the KL divergence is greater or equal zero, and then L is bound to our log likelihood. 
And so instead of maximizing the log likelihood, we will um, uh, uh, minimize L or maximize minus L. So that is the variational approximation. That can be quite a severe approximation because of that approximate likelihood me uh, method, but we can do it. Um, okay, how do we do it in practice? This just uh, rewrites L again. Uh, we can separate L into these two terms, and now we can interpret what they mean. And uh, uh, this basically directly gets us towards the loss function that we are optimizing in variational out encoder. So this here is the KL divergence between Q of Z given X given uh, and P of Z. P of Z is our prior distribution. We can define it somehow. Q of Z given X um, is also a modeling choice. So uh, given X, what is the kind of distribution we want to map to? Um, and it depends on some parameters that we can optimize. This is the encoder. Okay, this here is the decoder. We go from C to X, and now we want to maximize the probability uh, uh, to sample X given C. Okay, we can choose Q of um, Q of C, X, and, and P of C. So these are choices we can make. So we will make them in a way that we can compute this quantity here. And um, so basically, after, after we have done this, there are still a few details uh, that I need to explain how we compute these things in practice. But so when we have done this, um, uh, basically we have the following structure, um, the following learning structure, if you like. So we have samples X that go into the encoder. The encoder um, maps to a point C, but probabilistically. Um, and then um, uh, from a point C, we will go back to x, and we will try to make x and x hat similar to each other. OK. Um, <clears throat> the encoder models the approximate distribution in uh, latent space by minimizing the scale divergence. The decoder is trying to reconstruct the input. Okay, in practice, how do variational autoencoders work? So we have the input, we map to um, the moments of a distribution, mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, a Gaussian distribution. Uh, then we would encode, for example, the mean and the variance, and in a multivariate Gaussian distribution, usually what we do is we actually use a diagonal, uh, um, so isotropic Gaussians, so diagonal covariance matrices although we don't have to do this, but it's a, a, com a common choice. Then we take a sample from this distribution and decode it. Right? So then there are several issues here. And one obvious issue is we have um, a step in the network which is sample from this probability distribution. How do we train over something like this? Right? How, we de how do we com compute derivatives over uh, a uh, sample from a distri distribution. Okay, so first, uh, first uh, problem uh, that we solve the computation of this KL divergence that we had. So for this, we have said we choose the latent space distribution as a Gaussian, and we also choose the prior to be a Gaussian. And with these choices, we can just compute the KL divergence, and it ends up being this expression here. Right, so this is done. We just put this into our loss function. Um, Sorry. Yes. Say, say again. Is it only true for Gaussian? No, I think you can also do that for uh, for anisotropic Gaussians, but it just everything gets more expensive. You have a higher dimensional latent space, etc. <coughs> And you can, you can do this for, for many other distributions as well, not just for the Gaussian distribution. Um, OK. Uh, so the other part in the loss function is this reconstruction loss, like make the output of the decoder similar to what we put into the encoder. Um, so the problem here is that the reconstruction loss involves this expectation value. So, so what that means is we have an input, an image, we 
encoded, so we have our latent space variable. And now this loss function tells us we should sample from this distribution. So we should draw multiple random variables from this Gaussian that we have encoded. And average uh, log p of x given c over them. Um, so that's a bit inconvenient, uh, but what we can do instead, because we're go going to train this using stochastic gradient descent, so, so we will sa take samples of x anyway, um, that we just replace this expectation value by one sample. So every time we sample an x, we sample one z. Because we will, we will re revisit x many, many times during the training procedure, so we will eventually sample from this expectation value. Um, so we replace the expectation value by one sample. Um, and then the second problem, the fact that we cannot differentiate over taking a random variable from a distribution, we solve it by the so-called reparameterization trick. And that's a very important trick. Um, um, whenever there's sort of randomness in your neural network, so the, the idea is uh, take the, uh, rewrite the function in such a way uh, that the, the source of randomness becomes an input to your network. So here we can do this as follows. If we have to sample from a certain mean, uh, if, the, if you have to sample a Gaussian from a certain mean and covariance matrix, what we actually do is we sample from a, a, um, a normal distribution with a, a zero mean and unit covariance matrix. And this epsilon becomes an input to our neural network. Um, and then what we actually do inside the neural network is this calculation. So we take this epsilon, we multiply it with um, sigma of x, so with the variances. This is an output of our encoder network. And mu of x, it's also an output of our encoder network. And then here we have a differentiable operation. We cannot differentiate across this input, epsilon, but we don't need to because there are no parameters there. So we have rewritten this operation here, like take these outputs, sample from the distribution defined by these outputs, by this deterministic calculation, which depends on the stochastic input. So we cannot backpropagate across this lag here, but we don't need to. But now we have a path that we can back backpropagate over. So that's the reparameterization trick. OK, and this I will skip over. It's a, just a remark. All right, so variational autoencoder. So here are some examples. Um, so this is, uh, uh, these are examples from a phase database. Um, not sure if this was actually a supervised uh, learning task or unsupervised learning task. No, I think it must be unsupervised. So these are they're basically facial expressions of, um, um, of people. And so what this shows, and this is MNIST, and so what this shows is uh, interpolation in the latent space of a variational autoencoder after training. So we train this variational autoencoder to encode certain data. And then what we do is we take four samples of our data that defines four points in our latent space after encoding them. And then uh, what we simply do is we do linear interpolations between them and we map, map back through the decoder and then we get this. So we get a meaningful looking interpolation in our image space, which you wouldn't get if you did it in image space directly. Uh, so that is a representation of the idea that our latent space is somehow, um, or the, just the mapping from latent space to, to, to real space is somehow a smooth and continuous uh, function. Or things, objects in latent space are organized in such a way that neighbors are somehow similar to each other in image space. Okay, this is exactly the same slide that Patrick has shown uh, uh, before. So only using the reconstruction loss basically means you're doing a normal autoencoder. So you can get a, a, a good reconstruction perhaps uh, of your data, but you don't get a particular structure in latent space. So that means uh, if you would sample 
somehow from a Gaussian distribution in this latent space, then especially for high dimensional spaces, most of the time you would be in an area where you haven't really that doesn't con correspond to any data and it probably gives meaningless uh, results if you decode them. If you only do KL divergence, you get a very nice Gaussian, but you get essentially no organization of data points whatsoever. And if you combine them, you kind of get these clusters where similar I images, in this case, these are different MNIST letters, uh, digits, are uh, clustered together, are in contiguous regions, but the whole distribution still approximates a Gaussian that you can sample from. Okay, uh, so this is a, a, a nice and elegant structure. It's very uh, easy to implement actually, quite universal. You can use uh, many different uh, network types for the encoder or the decoder. Um, this advantage is this because of, as a, as a result of this variational approximation and another approximation that I haven't talked about in detail, images tend to be a bit blurry. Uh, so, so in terms of like visual impression, GAN results tend to be uh, better. Um, and um, uh, yeah tends to somehow, because of this blurriness, sometimes uh, ignore smaller local features. It isn't good on the edges. Um, and in practice, um, although uh, uh, e even if you present a VAE with a relatively high dimensional latent space, often uh, you populate only a relatively low dimensional space in there. So dimensionality of the latent space, of course, that's, an, that's another hyperparameter. Okay, so, yes, go. I just I wanted to say something and see what your reaction is, but like the, you know, I think a lot of times when people see the agents at first, there's this price about the Gaussian and something like that going on, and it seems like maybe it's something where you're kind of restricted to simple thing, but you know, if you change variables, yeah. just do normal base theorem, you can kind of turn that Gaussian into exactly. whatever you want. Very complicated you distribution. Absolutely. No, that, that is not really the restriction. I mean, the, the restrictions here are, for example, the, the variational approximation that you have to make in order to train this thing. And, and the second restriction is how you compute actually the reconstruction loss, because you cannot really evaluate this uh, multidimensional probability of generating x given z. You replace it by a function that has the same asymptotic behavior, like uh, something that uh, um, decomposes over the pixels, like a cross pixel-wise cross entropy, which is fine if uh, at the optimum this loss term is close to zero. But of course, in practice, it's not. So, so that's another source of error. All right. So Gaussian, there's a variation autoencoders, and then in um, in last part, I wanted to go to. Um, uh, something that we worked on in, in my group. Um, and this is basically an implementation of flows or a combination of flows with statistical mechanics. And so this is joint work with Simon, Jonas, who's here, and, and Tao, and just appeared last week in science. And so the idea is the following. Uh, so we, we're back with physics systems, and we're interested in sampling configurations of some physics system whose energy uh, is defined. So we know that somehow we, can, we have a function that we can evaluate and compute this energy for any given x. So this defines a Boltzmann distribution or Boltzmann type distribution of this form. Um, so in equilibrium, we would like to be able to sample from, uh, from mu of x, and this, this system could be a protein or it could be a Ising model or something else, doesn't really matter. The point is usually, d despite the fact that we know these, this distribution point-wise, up to a scaling factor that we, that we cannot compute, so we know the probability weights, it's very difficult to sample from this distribution. Right. 
So the, the, the variation autoencoder solution would be now, uh, instead of using this distribution, use another distribution uh, that we can sample from and make them similar, and then to sample from this distribution. But then, since we don't know, um, in a ver even in variational autoencoder, we don't know, we cannot evaluate the probability of the sample that we're generating, we cannot really go back to this distribution. So we have no tool and statistical mechanics that can tell us how to reweight the, the variational autoencoder distribution into this distribution. Um, so because of this, we want to go to model now that have tractable likelihoods where we can compute the probability distribution of the generator. All right, uh, so idea is still the same. We want a directed generative model. We go from a Gaussian or somehow easy to sample um, distribution of um, random variables to the object that we're interested in, just not faces this time, but maybe molecular structures. And um, now we will use a specific neural network construction, um, namely one that is invertible. Uh, so, first of all, these um, so uh, these networks are called flows. Uh, Kyle has talked about normal normalizing flows. So generally, the idea of normalizing flows is that we start from a normal distribution, uh, some other distribution that's easy to sample from, and we transform the distribution into one that's interesting, and we have a tractable likelihood. So whenever we sample from we sample from p of x, we can evaluate p of x as well. And then there are different ways to implement this idea. One way to implement it is through an invertible network. So uh, this idea uh, of training such an uh, invertible distribution in order to um, estimate a density, p of x, that is represented by data samples, such as images also, that's not new for us, so there has been a, um, work on this uh, um, with parametric PDEs actually uh, by Esteban Tabak and Eric Vandenein a few years ago. And then there are a couple of papers uh, um, by Laurent Dean, he, he will be in the, in the first workshop, on implementing something like this with so-called coupling layers that I'll talk about in a minute. And then there is this idea of normalizing flows, which is a little different, but also uh, leads to an tractable P of X. Okay, so basically we'll do this. So we will transform this simple distribution into something that is similar to our Boltzmann distribution that we want to sample from. But we will not quite achieve equality. Yeah, there will be an error left. This, this distribution will be different from the target distribution. And, um, but because we can evaluate P of X, we can for every point X that we sample from, also compute the probability ratio of P of X and the Boltzmann distribution up to a scaling factor. That's the partition function that we don't know, but we can compute relative weights. And if we can compute relative weights, we can use them in any computation of expectation values. And that's basically, a uh, like a lot of statistical physics methods are using these relative weights. Uh, Monte Carlo methods, et cetera, not just plain reweighting. You look not convinced. No, I'm just wondering why. Okay, uh, so I said we're using invertible transformations uh, for this neural network. Um, so basically we have a network F that allows us to compute Z from X or X from Z. And these two networks are using the same parameters. So one set of parameters parameterizes both directions. Why do we do that? Well, if we have an invertible and differentiable transformation, um, and we can compute the Jacobian of this transformation, so the derivatives of the outputs with respect to the inputs and the determinants of these matrices, then we can write down how random variables transform. 
Uh, so we can write down the probability distribution of x given the probability distribution of c, which takes this transformation from x to c and the Jacobian. And because we know p of c, because p of c is a simple distribution, we can then compute p of x, and this is what we want in order uh, to have a tractable likelihood and to be able to reweight the outputs of this neural network. Okay, how do we implement such an uh, invertible transformation? So there, are, there is a whole slew of methods uh, that, are, that are doing this, and here is a particular simple animal from this zoo, uh, two animals from the zoo. So this was kind of the first um, idea of coupling layers from this paper here. Um, and so NICE stands for non-linear independent component ana um, uh, component something estimation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, they're using uh, um, this approach essentially to do density estimation and to transform your complex density into a Gaussian density, hence independent components. Um, the idea is simple. You have uh, uh, your variables, x, and you just split them into two channels. Um, the first channel is simply copied to the next layer. So nothing happened here, so this is trivial to invert. Uh, the second uh, channel, you add to uh, these variables a transformation of the first channel. And this transformation is implemented with a feedforward neural network. And the only restriction we have here is that, well, we need to be able to differentiate through the neural network, and it needs to map to a dimension that is compatible with x2, right? so that we can do this uh, element-wise addition. That's all. Um, now we can, um, of course, um, concatenate these nice layers. And in the next step, we would, for example, swap uh, the role of one and two. So then we would just copy the second uh, layer, uh, the second channel, and we would modify the first layer as a function of the second, etc. So that eventually we will get nonlinear transformations on all of the variables. Okay, why is this useful? Well, because we can trivially invert it in this direction. So uh, x1 equals y1, so we can just invert this arrow. And we can uh, express x2 in, as a function of the y's by saying x2 is uh, y2 minus t of y1. So we don't have to invert t. Yes? So do x1 and x2 have the same dimension? They don't have to. It just my the, the inputs and the outputs of my neural network have, have to be compatible with my choices here. So this could be 1 and this could be 10. Then this has 1 input and 10 outputs. And I could also, after every layer, I could kind of swap things around between channels. Yes? So does that mean that in each layer, the, the change of variable somehow is triangular, right? So yes, that's the point. The Jacobian becomes a triangular matrix. But what, which in which ordering its triangular is different from one layer to the next. Yes, correct. Yeah. OK, uh, so now instead of just doing uh, additions and subtractions, we can also do multiplications and divisions in the same way. Of course, we have to be a little careful here with the numerics that can blow up in our face. But the idea is the same. So we have a network that uh, basically learns the scaling factors. And we can invert then such a, a scaling and trans translation layer by just doing divisions and subtractions um, in this way. So, uh, right. So Dima got the point. If we if we do this, then if we write down the Jacobian, the Jacobian is a is an upper diagonal diagonal matrix. Um, so I actually only need to look at the diagonals in order to compute the determinant of the Jacobian, which makes things efficient. Turns out that for this uh, transformation, actually the Jacobian is 1. And this is a volume-preserving transformation, so it preserves probability volume. If we think about flows, so um, these things are called flows because you can think of it, them as transforming um, like essentially moving probability density around like a fluid uh, in state space. This is like an incompressible fluid in physics. 
this is like compressible fluid, so you can have local changes of volume, uh, local change of probability volume, so that means you need a Jacobian, you need to compute a Jacobian, um, because you can have local scaling of volumes, basically. But it's still in, um, invertible, so we can essentially get um, um, all the information of how our probability transforms through local information, through the local Jacobian. Uh, the value of the Jacobian here turns out to be similar, simply the product of the output activations of the S network. So it's easy to compute again. Or if we work in log space, it's just the sum of the logs of the outputs of the S network. So it's very simple and efficient to compute. Okay, and then we have our invertible transformation. Okay, so how, we, how do we train this thing? Um, so again, uh, training um, the different training methods have been worked out for these flows, so that itself is not really a new thing. But our setting here, which is we actually know for every point that we generate, we know its energy, so we know its probability weight up to a scaling factor, really changes the game here. That makes certain training methods more favorable than others and more suddenly uh, accessible when they weren't accessible before. So, um, okay, so, so um, we'll use the, for the following uh, formalism here. So our prior distribution in C, so that's like our multivariate Gaussian distribution, that's called mu C. Then we generate a distribution P of X. Um, and if we have our Boltzmann distribution, we call that mu of X. And if we map back through two latent space, that's PC. <coughs> We will start, um, so we will want to sam sample from our Boltzmann distribution or close to it, and we will start from a Gaussian distribution in C. Um, okay, we have, a, we have a energy in X. We can assign a corresponding energy in C, which is basically just minus the log of the Gaussian distribution, and that is just the energy of a harmonic oscillator. All right, so going back to kullback leibler divergences again. So uh, try our luck with using kullback leibler divergences here and see, see what happens. So, um, the so there are two kullback leibler divergences, of course. Uh, I'm just going to call out this one, KL of mu and P, this direction. Sorry, mu Z and P Z. And you can uh, um, also write it down in X space, but I'm going to write it down in Z space here. So. I'm going to choose mu c here as, as the first distribution because I need to take this integral over this distribution. So I need to compute an expectation value over something that I can sample from. And I can easily sample from this one. Um, so then for every sample, I need to compute the difference between these log densities. Uh, so just inserting the Boltzmann distribution and the Gaussian distribution here, I can work out that it's equal to this expression plus some constants. The constants include things that I cannot compute, like my partition function in X, but it's a, it's a constant, so I don't care. Uh, so what I have left is simply the expectation value of energies of configurations that result of taking a Gaussian random variable and feeding it through the network, minus um, uh, the expectation value of the log of the Jacobian determinants. And it can be shown that this thing is actually a variational free energy here again. This is an internal energy, and this is an entropy. So this term is happy if I sample low energies. This term is happy if I sample more space, basically. So in some sense, this term prevents mode collapse, uh, prevents, the, prevents the sampling to collapse to one point. Okay, and I can easily evaluate this for every sample that I'm generating in my neural network, right? I can always uh, transform the Gaussian variable forward. I can compute the energy because I have the energy. Um, and I can compute these log de determinants because they are just very simple expressions depending on my scaling networks here. So this is kind of a natural thing to do if you know the energy. It's also called energy-based training. Um, the other um, 
um, the other KL divergence is unfortunately difficult to evaluate because it evalu uh, involves taking an expectation value of a mu of x, but that's the quantity that I want to sample in the end. So that's, that's something I cannot easily sample, at least not initially. Uh, so the, the, the kind of the stupidest thing to do, uh, but maybe a good starting point, is to just replace that by some data distribution. So that now means, let's say I let's say I know more than nothing. Let's say I uh, let's say that I know more than just the uh, definition of the energy function. Let's say I have a few samples from different states, but they don't have the right weighting. Uh, so I'll just use them to define a data distribution and I will evaluate the KL divergence over this distribution. And what I then get is simply the maximum, is simply a likelihood. Um, so what my likelihood function does basically is just, uh, it takes my few examples that I have, it, it transforms them to latent space and it compares the log likelihood in this space, uh, which is something like an energy that this point now has in my latent space, with the energy of my harmonic oscillator, which is the energy that I want to have, and tries to make that similar. Okay, and then there is another loss term that I can um, add if I want to have sample states along certain coordinates, but that's not so important now. Okay, so how does this thing behave? So um, here we have a two-dimensional state space, and this is a metastable system. We call this metastable because basically there is an energy barrier here. There are two low energy regions. So if we do something like molecular dynamics or Metropolis Monte Carlo in this space, we stay close to the minima most of the time, and it takes a long time to jump across the barrier. So going from left to right is a rare event. Right? Um, so we take samples here and here. I also indicate where the transition state is, although that, that wasn't used for training, so just that you see where it ends up. And then we, trans we train this Boltzmann generator, and what you see is basically it tries to repack the probability distribution such that in latent space we have more or less a Gaussian distribution. So now we can sample from a Gaussian distribution in latent space, map back, and then uh, because we know what probability density we're sampling from, we can reweight to the true uh, probability density, so to the Boltzmann weight, and that, that way we can compute actual statistics in our Boltzmann distribution, although our training points were not from a Boltzmann distribution at all. Um, so another way to express uh, the probability of points in the Boltzmann distribution is the free energy, so that's just minus the log of this distribution, and this is over one of the two variables, the slow variable here. So what we expect is that we get this black function, and the uh, functions that we sample from with this Boltzmann generator are the green or the yellow function. The yellow function is if we add another loss term which helps us to sample states contiguously along a certain direction. And we can do things like interpolation again. So we can take a point here and a point here, interpolate in latent space, map, map the path back to configuration space, and then we get a nonlinear, a set of nonlinear pathways uh, in, in, in real space that corresponds somehow to low energy pathways. Uh, okay, this is the same for the Müller potential, and it's just a free well potential. This is a more interesting case, um, kind of a, a toy model of a solid state system. Uh, so you have this box and you have these uh, repulsive particles. They repel each other with one over the distance to the 12th power. So that means if you, get, if you put them too close to each other, the energy goes up uh, a lot. So it's very difficult actually to find configurations in that system uh, that are low energy. And we have these two particles that like to be either close to one another or far apart. So they have an energy uh, function like this. So you, um, but unfortunately, you can't simply open or close this dimer. So going from one, one state to the other is, is, is difficult because you have to rearrange the solvent, uh, rearrange all of these gray particles because the system is so dense. Right, so it's not easy to come up with simple Monte Carlo moves that just go from here to here in one step. Uh, so we train this thing, this Boltzmann generator, basically on samples from this state and samples from that state. And it learns to place all of the particles in one shot um, by sampling some 60-dimensional Gaussian. And also samples some transition states that we haven't trained with. 
Um, so that's nice. We can also sample uh, free energies again. And this is actually uh, using the, the fact that there is a relatively simple relationship um, between the width of the Gaussian in latent space and the temperature of the distribution. Uh, so actually the temperature becomes, if we used a volume preserving network, so that one of these nice networks, it would be actually exactly true that just making the distribution wider just means making the system hotter. Um, if we have a non-volume preserving transformation, that's not really true anymore, but we can just pretend it's approximately true and train it with different temperatures. And then we have a model that actually can make predictions across temperature space. So this is one Boltzmann generator making predictions for different temperatures. <coughs> And then the, 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 green, uh, the green lines are for, from umbrella sampling simulation. So this is another uh, ray event sampling technique. Um, again, interpolation in latent space can result in physically meaningful pathways in real space. And then, uh, yeah. So the last comment I wanted to make is basically so, so this is really useful if you have um, a few samples from different states um, that you can start training with. And you may not know the relative weights of these states in the Boltzmann distribution, like computing these relative weights or computing free energy difference is something that's very difficult uh, for these high dimensional systems. And, and so this is a, a way that can help you do that. Uh, but also you can uh, uh, use this approach together with sampling methods um, that explore state space and maybe make them a lot more efficient this way. So here is just a like order zero idea. Uh, let's say we have some examples of configurations of a system. Uh, we train a Boltzmann generator so that will map those examples that we have to a Gaussian distribution in latent space. But now we want to find new states. We cannot hope initially that there is that we'll find a lot of new states just by sampling from this Gaussian, un unless we do other things. Because so far, we'll just have encoded essentially what we know. Right? But so what we could do is we could try to explore this latent space. For example, doing Metropolis Monte Carlo. Very simple. So we just do, like, we, we, we start from a latent point. We add a Gaussian random variable. We get a new point. Then we map back to real space, evaluate the energy of that point, and accept or reject. We also need the, the, uh, the difference between the log dead Jacobians, because that goes into the um, acceptance probability, but that's something we can compute. Um, so we have to evaluate this, this thing here. So then we sample new points, and we retrain our Boltzmann generator to reshape this transformation to accommodate the new points we have found. And with that, we can very quickly explore these low dimensional systems. And we can also explore this um, higher dimensional system and find new states. And you can construct now a lot of new methods by essentially taking this idea and marrying it with some statistical mechanics methods that some, somehow sample states like, I don't know, metadynamics, repli replica exchange, or whatever and then hopefully achieve better performance. We also did this for a, um, a implicitly solvated protein and showed that you can actually do this. So this is, um, this is really a sample from a Boltzmann generator using 3,000 dimensions uh, that places all of the atoms in one shot uh, for this guy, and you can actually get low energies. Uh, you need a lot of tricks to do that. I will not talk about that now. Uh, but so there is actually s hope that, that you can actually go to these relatively complicated problems with this approach and, and maybe circumvent the sampling problem. Um, a limitation is that in this, in this approach, we don't really find anything new. Maybe we would if we, if we combined it with uh, like this Metropolis Monte Carlo approach or something like this. But I think we need to build in more physics in order to understand that uh, like making certain changes here in the protein and making certain changes in another part of the protein where we see the same local chemical environment is that's a similar thing so that we can um, essentially learn more new things by training this this map okay and with this I would like to finish and yeah thank you for your attention <laughs>